Welcome to Hasbro's Wizards of the Coast, Dungeons and Dragons, Multiverse, Forgotten Realms, Big B Presents, Glory of the Giants. A book that's so skinny that half its width is just the covers. When I first picked it up, I thought, 60 bucks for 192 pages? But, to my surprise, it's not too bad. It's actually pretty good in some ways. Is this a case of quality over quantity? Is this our choice now? We have to pick between the bargain bin of books like Candlekeep Mysteries, Strixhaven, and Journeys to the Radiant Citadel, or price-hiked and scrawny Glory of the Giants. You know, for a book all about giants and gargantuan creatures, it's pretty ironic that it's like the smallest 5e book I've ever seen. But let's take a look at its bestiary and scrutinize the many fabulous creatures there, shall we? The theme of the monsters in here are giants, things related to giants, and big creatures. There are a lot of high CR monsters in here, and some noticeable changes to the monster design. There are some new approaches and new ideas. Are they for the better, though? That is a really good question. As usual, I will be rating the creatures based on five primary criteria. Mechanics, which looks for interesting and unique abilities. Style, which looks at aesthetics, tone, and flavor. Role-playing, which has to do with social interactions. Lore, which is the depth, legends, world-building, and adventure hooks. And versatility, which has to do with flexibility of the monster and a replay value. As usual, I will be ranking all these creatures as F through S tier. Oh there, adventurer. Have you struck the thumbs up of glory on this video? Have you pledged your oath of subscribing? Should you trespass as a mere lurker, you risk being squashed by my thunderous feet. My hurled boulders are as falling mountains. Beware! So, my brave companions, let's follow along with Big B. No, no, not the Big B we've all grown up with. The new Big B, who has now been retconned into an ethnically ambiguous modern-day American dude. Starting off F-tier is the giant tick. It's a medium-sized tick, about as large as a boar. The lore says they feed off of giants. That makes no sense. Giants would just pull them off and kill them. It would be like a tick the size and weight of a rabbit trying to go unnoticed latched onto a human. The bag jelly is a kind of simple ooze that most often lives inside the bags of giants, subsisting on whatever gunk is in there. It's resistant to being squished and has 42 hit points, which is quite high HP for a CR1 monster. Fun fact, the highest hit points on a CR1 creature goes to the Quotoa Whip. It has a whopping 65 HP. At the top of F tier is the giant ram, which is a big fey animal. Its fleece gives it resistance to magic and a few energy types, and the magical energy that it absorbs, it can channel into a blast of force damage. Actually, it can just use its force bolt at will. It gives it a sort of short range eldritch blast cantrip. Also, if you shear its fleece without injuring it, the wool serves as a cloak of resistance, or you can sew it in as lining to a suit of armor turning the armor into armor of resistance. All this on just a CR1 monster, which has some pretty big implications on the economy of the D&D world. But hey, who cares, right? That's it for F tier. Some pretty decent creatures, I guess, for F tier. Very simple, very limited, but with tiny nuggets that maybe you could do something with. The bottom of D tier is the Spotted Lion. They are double the size of regular lions, and they hunt megafauna in prides. It's a very simple creature. I'm not sure about the spots. I get that cats are stealth hunters, and spots help with camouflage, particularly for solo hunters. But if the creature is the size of a big hippo or even an elephant, and it lives in groups, I doubt it's going to be hiding in the bushes very much. I mean, regular lions don't have spots. Anyways, moving on, Titanotheres are a family of enormous mammals related to rhinoceroses. They definitely give an Ice Age sort of vibe. It's a very simple, stompy brute that sometimes gets used as a beast of burden. 
The Ceratops is a gargantuan monstrosity dinosaur with magic resistance and simple goring, charging, and stomping attacks. Something I've noticed about the Glory of the Giants book is how the wording for conditions being inflicted is different. Like with the Ceratops' goring charge, if the target fails its strength saving throw, it has the prone condition. Not it gets knocked prone, but simply has prone. This change in wording was not necessary, and it sounds awkward. It also has this passive, neutral language. Oh, now you just happen to have prone, instead of the Ceratops knocking you prone, which is active, strong language. The writer in me disdains passive, boring, sterile phrasings. Bleh. The Altasaur is the next in this cycle of monstrosity dinosaurs. It is like a walking mountain. Definitely the biggest creature in 5e D&D, with its head 150 feet above the ground, eight legs, each the size of a massive ancient tree, a tail that carves gullies as it passes, and lava-like lines on its body described as patterns, though the artwork does not show them as patterns, but irregular organic lines like cracks in a hard surface. This monster is so massive and staggering and at the same time very simple. The next mythical monster dinosaur is the Regisaur, and we're still in low D tier. It's similar in style to the previous two dinosaur-like creatures. It bites, slaps with its tail, and can swallow creatures that it has restrained in its jaws. Now into mid D tier we have the Giant Ox, another huge fey animal and potential beast of burden. It can trample and gore and knock its targets to the ground. Oh wait, I mean, it can be utilized such that its target might have the prone condition. Here, have some prone. Oh no, I'm quite full. No, I insist. Have the prone condition. Well, if you insist. The Cinder Hulk is the first in a cycle of elemental Hulk creatures in this book. They're all giants that have transformed into elementals. Typically, this happens when the giant spend centuries exposed to energy of an elemental plane. The hulks are smaller, large instead of huge, and have simpler, narrower motivations and personalities. The cinder hulk sends out waves of smoldering ash that burn and blinds creatures in the cone. Oh, excuse me, the creatures who failed their deck saves have the blinded condition. And also when the Hulk dies, it explodes, creating a cloud of heavily obscure smoke that is hot enough to cause fire damage to the creatures in it. The last dinosaur in this ranking is the Aerosaur in high D tier, which is also gargantuan size and has magic resistance. It flies extremely fast. It grabs targets in its teeth, rakes with its talons, and can beat its wings to cause a thunderclap in a 10 foot radius, which deals thunder damage and causes targets to have the prone condition. By the way, get used to a lot of things from this book, knocking targets prone. That happens a lot. The Stone Giant of Evil Earth has a somewhat awkward name and it kicks off another cycle of monsters in this book, the Giants of Elemental Evil. In this case, they are stone giants who have rejected the gods of the Ordning to follow Ogremok, Primordial Lord and Prince of Evil Earth. These stone giants fashion bulky armor out of rock and wield clubs of stone that are imbued with thunder damage and somehow never crack or shatter. This also brings up another design approach that you will see a lot of in this book. Monsters never have the magical attacks trait, but they often have attacks that deal both physical damage and some kind of energy damage. It's odd because no real explanation is given. Like with the Stone Giant of Evil Earth, it wields a Thundering Stone Club. It deals bludgeoning damage plus 3d6 thunder damage to the target and each creature other than the giant within 30 feet. The lore says that this giant's club pulses with thunderous energy, but the stat block does not actually say that it is a magical weapon. When the characters kill the Stone Giant and take its club, what is its value? That magical effect is incredible, it's like a very rare or legendary item, maybe even an artifact. I don't know, can the characters sell it? What about if they magically reduce its size so they can wield it as a two-handed great club with that incredible thunder effect on it? 
Or could a character use the enlarge spell and wield this club as like a two-handed maul? Or is the magic actually not in the weapon itself, but rather some invisible feature that this giant has in which by just existing, the club gets that amazing thunder effect? But in true 5th edition fashion, the answer is, who knows? Figure something out, DM, and hope your players don't whine and gripe at you about it. Next is another elemental hulk creature. This one is a rhyme hulk, which is a transformed frost giant that's made out of ice and, well, frost, as its name suggests. It's a simple creature that attacks with slams, surges ahead in trails of frost, and explodes in a burst of cold when it dies. At the top of D tier is an undead hill giant called a Barrowgast. This is no mere zombie, but a unique kind of undead that sometimes occurs when a hill giant starves to death, and it dies full of wrath and regret. Negative plane influence reanimates this anomaly of a giant undead, and instead of hungering for food, this ghastly hill giant hungers for life energy. Like a typical ghast, it does have a stench that can sicken enemies as though a poison, but it does not have paralyzing claws or paralyzing slams. Instead, its natural bludgeoning fists have a life-draining touch like a white. When it gets cut or stabbed, poisonous fluid squirts out from it at the attacker. It's a pretty good low-tier undead. Nothing groundbreaking, sort of like a remix of basic things that we've seen for many years. I like the name quite a bit. It has a strong and creepy and classic sound to it, though it's kind of an odd choice for a name of this creature. For one, this is a specific and rare hill giant undead, and the name has nothing to do with that. And for two, it is not a ghast or a ghoul at all, so that seems like a wasted opportunity, as this could have been a really cool hill giant ghoul, as a cannibal hill giant would be really fitting due to how they are notorious for being such gluttons. Speaking of consuming, it's also odd that the Barrowgast's life drain doesn't cause it to regain hit points, though the baseline white from the Monster Manual has the same attack, and it doesn't self-heal either. It's also odd that the Barrowgast has a white's attack instead of a ghast's attack. And there's another monster in Glory of the Giants called the Cairn White, but it doesn't have a white's attack. Ugh, whatever. That concludes D-tier and the lower ranks of monsters in Glory of the Giants. They're all somewhat decent. I could see myself using them here or there, but nothing is all that good, and at least not without some significant alterations or the DM creating some interesting stories around them. This relates to another of the trends that we find in this book. The lore of the bestiary is, well, not good. Other sections of the book do have some cool giant lore, or at least cool lore about the giant gods and their enclaves and layers, their treasures. There are some nice adventure hooks and some encounter tables. But when it comes to the actual monsters in the bestiary, we typically just get crumbs, maybe a morsel here or there. We now set our sights on C tier, which is going to include so many monsters. Before we do, I want to announce that the development of Monstrous Heroes is coming along very well, with playtesting in full swing, and the 17 different monster classes are in active, ongoing revision in order to fine-tune them and balance them. If you haven't checked out this project yet, make sure to have a look. You can also pre-order it either in hardcover or digital PDF. You can also take part in an open playtest and provide feedback. Whether you are a player or a GM, this book is for you. It's overflowing with options that you can use to add in a bit of monstrous flair or to even go full-blown monster campaign. See the link down in the video description. Moving into low C tier, we have another elemental hulk, the Mud Hulk. It comes from hill giants that are seeped in earth and water elemental energy for generations until becoming mud elementals. It reminds me in a way of the muck spawn from my book, Esper's Emporium of Esoterica. It can slip through tiny cracks, it can turn the ground around it into sticky mud, its slam attack can engulf the target into the Hulk's muddy body, and it can fling masses of mud at a range. The Fire Gaunt is another undead creature in the book. This one comes from a fire giant who died 
Seething with bitterness and animosity, it reanimates because of unspecified reasons. I guess the designers couldn't be bothered to give us more than just crumbs of lore about this. Attacking the fire gaunt up close causes fire to spout out from its crackled, burned body. It can also unleash a cone of fire from its eyes, mouth, or wounds, which scorches creatures in the area and catches them on fire. And it has a heated maul that deals bludgeoning damage along with, surprise, surprise, fire damage and necrotic damage. The attack reads as though the maul itself possesses this magical property, but nothing comes right out and clearly states that. Nothing states that the maul attack itself is magical. Moving on, we come immediately to yet another undead, the Cairn White, which is actually not a white at all, but a stone giant who becomes obsessed with its stonework, with sculpting and building such that, and I quote, death can't stop it. And snap, it just becomes an undead so it can keep on working. It doesn't even have to become evil, just stays neutral. Man, someone should tell this to wizards who are considering the extreme hazards of becoming a lich. Anyhow, the Cairn White looks like a petrified stone giant. It attacks with slams and rocks, and it can petrify other creatures with its touch. Its slam somehow has a higher base damage dice than an actual stone giant's great club, and its petrifying touch, for some reason, also deals force damage. If you pay close attention to current D&D design, You'll notice that force damage has become the generic, can be anything we need it to be, damage type. Our next specimen is the Fury of Koschichi, a frost giant who has transformed into a demon due to the powers of Koschichi, who he himself originally was a frost giant but became a demon lord after conquering a corner of the abyss and making his lair there. The fury of Koschichi has an aura of cold damage, magic resistance, a fist natural weapon that deals bludgeoning damage plus cold damage, throwing rocks, and a bonus action feature called charge, which causes the fury to dash toward an enemy it can see. The problem with this name is that it's not actually a charge. Charge is what we see with things like minotaurs and rhinos in which they run at a creature, they hit with a gore or some other attack that deals extra damage and knocks the target prone. What the Fury has is the feature aggressive, like an orc. Plodding into mid C tier is another transformed frost giant, this time one that has turned into an icy undead. It's like a revenant in that it was killed in a very wrongful manner and has come back for vengeance. Except in this case, it usually keeps on killing the living even after its own murderer has been slain. It's a bit hypocritical of it. I wonder if this could create an endless chain of Frostmorns. A frost giant gets murdered, rises as a Frostmorn, then goes on to kill another frost giant, which in turn becomes another Frostmorn, and so on. It has an icy touch attack which turns creatures into statues of ice instead of killing them when they would reach zero hit points. Any amount of fire damage can melt the ice statue, by the way, and restore the creature. Any amount of fire damage, even one fire damage from a little candle flicker, would melt an entire 20 foot tall giant ice statue. Uh, okay. It has an icy axe that deals slashing damage and, you guessed it, mysterious ice damage. And it has a polar ray, which is like a much more powerful ray of frost cantrip. It also has a defensive ability. When it gets hit by an attack, it can use its reaction to turn into a cloud of snow and frost, taking only half damage from the attack and teleporting up to 30 feet. This is a pretty cool monster overall. If only it had a little bit more going on with its role playing and its lore, I could easily see it being a B tier creature. The giant lynx is a human sized fey cat that is intelligent and speaks both the giant and sylvan languages. They are crafty stealth hunters and can even use the clairvoyant spell to view areas at a distance. They usually live in small groups, working together, though sometimes are pets or allies of giants. The Echo of Demogorgon is an Etin that follows the demon lord, Demogorgon, and has been transformed into a demon itself. Its arms become tentacles and its heads become more savage and bestial. The tentacles deal bludgeoning damage plus necrotic damage, and as a bonus action, it can scream at a creature who must make a wisdom save, and on a failure, the Echo of Demogorgon chooses for it to attack a creature or to take psychic damage. 
Up next, we have the final three of the Hulk creatures that are giants turned elementals. There's the Dust Hulk, which used to be a stone giant, but now is a cloud of dust and gravel that uses its own body as its work of art, reforming and resculpting itself. It can slip through tiny cracks, it attacks with slams and stinging grit that can blind targets, and when it dies, it bursts in a 10-foot radius that can also blind creatures. The Lightning Hulk comes from Storm Giants and is essentially a living bolt of lightning, sometimes coalescing into a giant-like appearance. It has lost much of the contemplative nature and sense of purpose that Storm Giants have and basically just zips around arcing lightning and shocking creatures wildly. It still is an intelligent creature, however, so it's not so simple as an actual air elemental, but it's definitely a notch or two lower in terms of depth compared to an actual storm giant. And the last Hulk is the Mist Hulk originating from Cloud Giants, which I've always found to be the most interesting and deep of the D&D giants. The Mist Hulk appears as a giant shaped rain cloud, and it has a sense of tragedy and loss to it. It can even call up past regrets within those who hear its wail, sort of ghost-like in a way. It attacks with slams, its wailing deals psychic damage and can render targets incapacitated, and when it dies, it bursts in a torrent of rain that bludgeons and knocks creatures prone. That wraps up the cycle of elemental Hulk creatures in the book. They are a new take on giants that I think works pretty well, though a little bit contrived. As is all too common, I wish they would have just like one more unique ability and a little bit more in terms of lore. Couldn't we have gotten some stories at least some outlined tales about some specific giants who became elemental hulks. Taking a quick detour from actual giant creatures, we have a giant bug, the gigant. The gigant? The gigant? The gigant? I don't know how to say that. When I first looked at this thing, it reminded me of my Gagatha monster from the Labyrinthine Garden setting. They're both gargantuan-sized bugs of tremendous power, and they're known for their droning and secreting a liquid onto creatures and objects. The Gagatha has a musk pheromone, while the Gigants is a poison. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Surely. Surely. Giants view Gigants in different ways. Some believe they are harbingers of doom. Others say they are defenders of nature. Others still claim that they're some kind of divine messenger. Curiously, the Gigants are so enormous that their preferred prey is giants. The artwork done by Christopher Burdett even shows a Gigant carrying off a hill giant in its clutches. It's a fantastic insectile monstrosity here. The next monster also has a very high challenge rating, the Runic Colossus. As you can see, it is a construct, and a gargantuan-sized construct at that. According to legend, the Colossus was built by an alliance of different kinds of giants. From the lore it says, Stone and Hill Giants hewed a mighty form from living stone. Cloud and Frost Giants gathered rare metals, and Fire Giants shaped them into flexible joints and plated armor. Storm Giants inscribed the runes into the inert form to give it the semblance of life. The fruits of these labors was an everlasting guardian, the first runic colossus. As you can imagine, it is an extremely tough creature, but it doesn't have anything in terms of intellect or personality. It slams and stomps and knocks targets prone and crushes its enemies beneath its massive feet. It can also shoot beams of magical force in a 150 foot line, though its most unique feature is its twice per day spell reflection, a reaction it takes when a creature casts a spell. The Colossus shoots a beam of force as a spell attack and if the caster gets struck, he has to succeed on a DC-15 intelligence save, or the spell fails. This is a fantastic monster in certain ways, though a lopsided one, as it has nothing for role-playing, it's not really versatile, and what interesting bits are in its lore are just hints of things they don't get developed. We now go into high C tier. These creatures are as good as it gets for the mid-range, just a hair shy of B tier, usually because one or more areas are just too lacking to round them out, so they still have that kind of lopsided quality. The Frost Giant of Evil Water brings us back to the cycle of elemental evil cult giants. Not the giants who turned into elementals, but the ones who abandoned the gods of the Ordning to serve the elemental lords. 
In this case, it is a frost giant dedicated to Ol Hydra, the princess of evil water. It attacks with a battle axe that deals slashing damage and, you guessed it, mysterious cold damage. It also has a harpoon, which I always think is a really interesting type of weapon or effect. Oh, and of course, it can swim quite fast and it breathes in water. Glory of the Giants actually has three Fomorian creatures. Fomorians are a race of evil giants or giant kin who were warped by an ancient curse. They've been around since first edition, and 4E gave them a substantial push. The entry we have here is the Fomorian Deep Crawler, which is highly reminiscent of the 4E god Torog, the king that crawls. Torog, and the Raven Queen I would say, are two gods created by 4E that were both very interesting, but alas, only the Raven Queen seems to have survived the transition into 5E. Is the Fomorian Deep Crawler a spiritual successor to Torog? Or perhaps a clue that Torog is still out there somewhere? Or should I say, down there somewhere, dragging and tunneling through the Underdark? But wait, a quick consultation with Sage Google reveals that Torog was actually inspired by Karuntor, a lesser giant god from the Forgotten Realms known as the King That Crawls. And aha, the Fomorian Deep Crawler's very lore references this Karuntor. Uh, very well then, carry on. So the Deep Crawler is a freaky giant who skitters or spider climbs along. It attacks with slams and can hex creatures such that they fall prone and must go around prone, crawling for one hour without repeated saves. That's pretty interesting. And of course, we can't just have this be a curse that inflicts a debilitating condition. No, it also deals 78 psychic damage on top of it. Speaking of comebacks, we have finally gotten official Death Giants in 5e. Two of them in this book, one of which is the Death Giant Reaper. Death Giants are Shadowfell Giants, so they are gloomy and grim and gothic. My first impression of this Reaper was mixed. It's stylish, but doesn't really remind me of a Death Giant, which are supposed to be more horrific. Looking sort of like giant vampires. But this one just looks like an elf woman. The Reaper attacks with a scythe that deals slashing damage, plus, you guessed it, mysterious necrotic damage. She also has a soul bolt that deals necrotic damage, frightens the target, and grants temporary hit points to the Reaper herself. As a bonus action, she can teleport and simultaneously frighten creatures. Well, it's not the death giant I'd hoped for, but it's not terrible. The Storm Crab has some excellent art, also by Christopher Burdett. It shows just how colossal these crustaceans are, as it's preying upon a dragon turtle. These massive monstrosities were created by the giant god Stronmouse to battle aquatic dragons, in fact. They swim the depths and hunt the coasts, seizing prey in four pincer claws, and striking with a venomous stinger that poisons and paralyzes the target. It can also release intense jets of water in a 150-foot line that deals bludgeoning damage and blasts creatures back 30 feet and knocking them prone. Or in Glory of the Giants language, they have the prone condition. <laughs> the Storm Crab is a simple monster in some ways, but a great monster. Up next is the Maw of Yunogu, which is another giant turns demon creature. It comes from hill giants influenced by Yunogu, the demon lord of hunger and slaughter, the same demon lord that spawned the gnolls. It fits really well for hill giants, and this is one of the freakiest 5th edition monsters I think I've ever seen. Just look at this grotesquerie of a nightmare giant. It attacks by either biting or spitting slash flinging teeth at a range. It can charge ahead, goring and grabbing up targets. Those who are already grabbed in its maw when it does that charge are knocked prone. And as a reaction, whenever a creature damages the maw of Yunogu, it bites or flings teeth at a random creature. At the top of C tier is another giant turned fiend. This time, a devil. It's called a Fire Hellion. It comes from a fire giant who allies with devils and joins in their eternal fight against demons, the Blood War. Through all this, it becomes corrupted and transformed. It has magic resistance, plus Morningstar attacks that deal piercing damage, plus mysterious fire damage. This Morningstar hit also shuts down the target's ability to regain hit points for a round. The Fire Hellion can shoot magical balls of fire 
and necrotic damage together, which is sort of like a fireball, but even stronger, and the Hellion can use it at will. But its most striking feature is Soul Taker. Whenever the Fire Hellion reduces a giant or humanoid to zero hit points, that creature dies. Right away, no death saving throws. After 1d4 hours, its soul is sent to Avernus, the uppermost layer of the Nine Hells, where it becomes a Lemure. The only hope at this point, outside of a wish spell, is to travel to Hell, find that Lemure, and kill it, then resurrect the creature's original body. That is intense, and the potential is there for this monster to put the party in dire straits, with the urgent need to make an extra planar side quest to Hell nonetheless, to prevent their ally from being swooped up by all kinds of other devils and claimed as infernal currency. That wraps up C tier. There are lots of C tier monsters in this book, which is not unusual for D&D bestiaries. As is usual, they are a mixed lot, some good aspects, some not so good aspects, but we are seeing progress. This book about giants has resulted in a giant sized video, so big in fact that I need to split it into two parts. Make sure you are subscribed and with the notifications bell activated so that you won't miss out on the second half, which will be coming very soon. Thanks everyone for watching, and thanks especially so to all my supporters on Patreon who help make this kind of content possible. I'll be back before you know it. May your adventures be many.